Hello and welcome back to another episode of The Mark Moss Show, where of course each and every week we're talking about the way the world is changing through what I call the decentralized revolution. If you haven't noticed, <laughs> the world is changing, but you maybe don't understand what the heck is going on. And of course, we talk about it each and every week. Most importantly, so you can understand where things are going. I was talking with uh, my show producer Q before we were recording and going through some of the show notes and talking about some of the different topics and, you know, some of the big news topics that came out this week. Um, he's like, yeah, I don't know if it's that big of a story because it's not like tradable. There's nothing that someone's going to do to change their you know investment portfolio off of this. And that's absolutely right. Uh, what we talk about day to day isn't for you to go make a trade in your portfolio tonight on your E-Trade or Charles Schwab or whatever and profit from this. What it is, is it's about getting the direction right because the world's changing. And so um, in the in the quote that's been uh, used uh, way too way too misused, I would say, uh, but I'm going to use it anyway. And that's from the great Wayne Gretzky, the great one, one of the best hockey players of all time. And he said that uh, the reason why he did so good paraphrasing was because he always skated to where the puck was going to be, not where the puck was. Right. So you heard that before. Um, so sorry for me to tell you again, but that's really the way it is. The reason why it's used so much is because it's so true. And so what we want to do is we want to position ourselves to where things are going, not where they are. If we go to where they are, by the time we get there, it's going to be too late. And so we want to know where things are going. And so we look at the long lens. Warren Buffett, of course, you know, good old uncle Charlie, uh, or Warren Buffett, his partner, Charlie Munger, has another quote that I like to use all the time. And he says that the big money is not made in the buying and the selling. It's made in the waiting. So you put those two things together. It's made in the waiting. Waiting for what? Waiting for the right opportunity waiting for that big fat pitch to come. But more importantly, when I get into that position, I have to also wait for it to develop. And so this is about the direction of where things are going so we know that we're aligned properly as they continue to materialize. So in this hour, we're going to talk about the energy crisis and how the transition is causing the failure. How it's the transition that's causing the energy crisis to happen. We're going to talk about that. We're going to look at what the transitions are. We're going to look at this ESG, break that down, environmental social governance. We're going to talk about moving from reliable to unreliable energy. We're going to talk about why these transitions fail. We're going to cover the origins, uh, the companies that are taking advantage of this, uh, if there is any real progress, um, and so much more. This is a big show. Uh, I know I've talked about ESG a little bit in the past. We've never done this deep of a dive. And it's important for you to understand this because it is literally changing the world. Without energy, I mean, <laughs> I can't even say without energy. Without energy, the whole world's dead. I mean, we need energy. The law of energy states that energy cannot be created. Energy can only be transferred. So everything in life is about energy. For example, for you to live, your body must burn calories. A calorie is a unit of, it's a measurement unit of energy, right? So uh, the sun produces energy. It grows a plant or uh, uh, the, a cow eats the plant. And that, that energy from the plant is from the sun to the plant and then from the plant to the cow. And then I eat the cow, which gives me energy and protein. And then that gives me energy to burn as calories. And so that's how the whole world works. And then I can dig oil out of the ground, which is more energy, which then powers my car and on and on and on. So it's important to understand that all of humanity's uh, prosperity and flourishment comes because of energy. You know, uh, things used to be really bad a long time ago. And really all of history is a story of people being cold and hungry. That's most of history, people being cold and hungry. Read back through the early 1900s, the 1800s, the 1700s. You've seen the movies, the Game, Game of Thrones, and it looks like all like, oh, look at them living in these beautiful castles and life is so good. No, 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 no. <laughs> that's not how it worked. They were cold and they were hungry, and that's how most of the world is, without energy. There was famines. Uh, there was droughts, but then we got energy and we could build tractors that could build canals and bring water in. Amazing. And it's through the use of energy that we've been able to flourish. And you can trace back every possible nation, uh, prosperous nation, back to the amount of energy that they have. And that's really where the United States took off in the lead um, because we were able to harness oil and energy, which led to the industrialization, which allowed to massive prosperity through using energy to manufacture goods and services that the world wanted and so forth. So we're going to talk about all this. I'm going to break it down. And again, if you want to be, if you want to be where the puck is going, you have to understand this. 
If you want your investments to be in the right place, then you need to understand this. Now, I like to say it's not tradable, but of course, if you're not already in position, then I suppose you should be getting into position, but this is not financial advice. Uh, but you are listening to The Mark Moss Show. If you miss any of this, don't worry, I got your back. Check me out on the podcast. Just search The Mark Moss Show on any of your favorite podcast players. And if you could just do me a huge favor while you're there, just click on the um, like, review button on the podcast. Share it with somebody who you think could benefit from it. That'd mean the world to me. That's all I ask. Okay, so let's talk about this for a little bit. I want to break this down. We got a lot to cover. So first of all, ESG. What is it? More importantly, how did we even get here? Okay. Now, if you want to look at how we got here, we kind of have to go back to the origins. And what we can see that the origins of, of ESG and ESG investing really came by the key decision makers who wanted to use socially, you know, social responsibility as like an investing thesis. And I have no problem with that. As a matter of fact, I'm a huge proponent of that. As a matter of fact, I constantly pound the table on that we should be voting with our money, right? So <clears throat> I shouldn't be giving my money to things I don't like. So for example, I've been writing a financial newsletter for the last seven years where I do give uh, people information on what they should be buying and selling. If you want to check that out, just go to my website at um, one Mark Moss, um, and you can find out how to get access to the um, newsletter there. But in this newsletter, um, I used to um, recommend that we bought stocks in China. As a matter of fact, we did really, really well investing into Chinese companies and Chinese stock markets and Chinese funds and things like that. Emerging markets are a great place to get alpha, right? To get out, to get profits. But about when the pandemic came out, all of a sudden I just thought about it and I'm like, I don't really want to be supporting China anymore. There's millions of places to invest. Why do I need to put my money into those? I don't agree with them. So I'm no longer going to give them my money. So I believe in uh, using your money to voice your vote, but also to build the world that you want. So for example, you also know that I'm a huge Bitcoin proponent. I believe that Bitcoin is the only tool that we see right now today that can change the world, that can free us and that can, that, that can change the world for better. If not Bitcoin, then what? I don't see anything else. Now, maybe something else comes in the future, but as of now, that's the only one. So I believe that. You don't have to. That's okay. And so I want to see that flourish. So I want to put my money into Bitcoin. I also want to support the ecosystem. So I invest through the entire Bitcoin ecosystem, including I'm an advisor to a Bitcoin um, venture capital fund, Trammell Venture Partners. And I also started my own Bitcoin fund called the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund. And we're investing through the entire Bitcoin ecosystem because I want to put my money to build the world that I want. Now, if you'd like to learn more about the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund, check it out, bitcoinopportunity.fund. Just go onto your website, bitcoinopportunity.fund. You do need to be a, um, a credit investor for that. Uh, but it's a good way to get access to this entire industry that way. So anyway, I am a big proponent. I recommend everybody invest into building the world that, they, that we want. And so that's how ESG got started, right? It started in the 1960s as socially responsible investing, which sounds pretty good. 1971, the Pax World Fund was established by two United Methodist ministers who opposed the Vietnam War. So they didn't want to invest any money that would go towards the war. Great. Uh, we saw Amy Dominey, who managed KLD Research and Analytics. She created a Dominey 400 Index in 1990. You know, we can kind of go through this. Um, ESG largely came from a combination of national and international standards. One of the significant milestones was the United Nation Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1992. And this is where things really started to go a different direction. So the UN pushing them in 1992. And this is where I start to diverge from their idea of investing socially and my idea of investing socially. I'm going to talk about that in a second. If you're just tuning in right now, you're listening to the Mark Moss Show. Of course, we're always talking about this decentralized revolution. I'm going to break this down so you know where we're going. But one of the best ways to protect yourself for over 5,000 years, I like to call it a chaos hedge. Hedge myself against the chaos has always been with gold. It's, it's been money for 5,000 years, and it will probably continue to be some form of reserve asset or store of money. And one of the best ways that I've found to get gold, what I do is I use a company called Universal Coin and Bullion. Um, they have really low prices on popular silver and gold bullion, which is important. But more importantly, I trust them because I've worked with Mike Fulgen, the 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 president of the company. He wrote the consumer alert on gold coins for the Texas Attorney General. 
And so you know that he can be trusted. And like I said, they have great prices. And he has a very special offer for my listeners. He's going to give you a one ounce gold American Eagle coin. It's the most popular gold bullion coin in the world at his dealer cost. And he's even going to ship it to you free. But he'll also throw in his 30 page national award winning gold guide. Absolutely free if you mention me, Mark Moss. Give him a call 1 800 UCB Gold. Again, 1 800 UCB Gold. Or go online to universalcoin.com slash Mark Moss. Again, universalcoin.com slash Mark Moss. We can go back and we can see all types of examples through history where people formed groups. So like there was one, the Women's Christian Temperance Unit, uh, Union, WCTU, founded in 1874. And they promoted investing into things that they shared ideology. So for example, um, they didn't invest in the companies that produced alcohol or tobacco. Great. If you don't like alcohol, or tobacco, you don't want people to have it, then don't invest into it. That's fine. Um, <clears throat> the company didn't want to invest into any companies that would exploit its workers or engage in unethical business practices. Great. Don't do that if you don't want to. I think that that is a good thing. But these were like a really like OG, you know, old school, um, in socially responsible investing group, and that's okay. But um, going back to ESG for a second, like I said, it was introduced by the UN, and we saw it really become officially introduced in 2006, again, by the UN, in their Principles for Responsible Investment Report, PRI. And basically, the ESG criteria were required to be incorporated in the financial evaluations of companies. And so what that means is that they now had a set of metrics that they could regulate companies by. So we could say, hey, we're going to look at you company by all these metrics. And if you don't fit into them, then maybe there's no money for you. So we're going to talk about this. It's really turned from cooperation and um, from preference to now coercion. And that's where things fall off the rails. Now, um, I want to talk about Again, I think this is a good thing. We should be investing into things that we believe. Um, Milton Friedman, uh, a, a famous economist, if you haven't read his stuff, I highly recommend it. He wrote um, a paper on the socially responsibility, the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits because that's sort of what a business is for. Now, if you want to go be, you know, uh, Mother Teresa or Gandhi, then you should certainly do that. If you're a church, then you should certainly be feeding the poor. But business is in the business of business, which is to make profit. And it's the socially responsible thing to do. And what he says, and I'm going to paraphrase this, and I highly recommend you to go read it, but he basically says that through the pursuit of profit, you chase the most socially responsible goals. So let me give you an example. Um, there's a local high school here by my studio. I drive by it every morning on my way to the gym. And on the fences of the, of like the baseball field are like signs, and, and the whole school, are signs of all the local businesses, local real estate agents, local dentists, orthodontics, whatever, right? Why do they give money to the school to have their sign there? Why do they want to have their sign there? Well, they hope it brings them business. So through the pursuit of profit, they're acting socially. Right? They're giving money to a good cause in returns of hopefully getting a profit back. Now, let me just say, I also believe that we should all be giving money charitably. This is a really big problem that I want to dive into just for a second. Um, I was recently on an airplane um, sitting in first class, um, sitting next to another guy who looked like he, I, I kind of glanced over at his work and I could tell he was working on some like high level management stuff. And so I kind of struck up a conversation with him, which I don't always do. Um, and we start, then we start getting into like uh, business stuff and then we start getting into like investing and then we start getting into like social political things. And, you know, he really thought that, you know, the government needs to continue to tax us so much so that they, the government, they, after they tax us can go do all these welfare programs and things like this. And I just said, Hey, let, let me ask you a personal question. I'm sorry if it's too personal, but um, how much of your income do you give to charity? Do you, do you donate? Do you, do you go on mission trips with your kids and help um, poor people? And he said, no, we don't do any of that. And I said, yeah, I, I, I figured. And, and the reason why is because because you don't give, then you feel that nobody else will give. And so the only way that those poor people get anything is if the government steals it from us and then redistributes it. But you see, I give a big chunk of what I earn, and so I don't see it that way. 
I see people all around me giving. As a matter of fact, I just got back from my 15th annual dirt bike trip we do called the Baja Beach Bash.com. Check it out where we raise money for an orphanage down in Mexico. This year, in 2023, in July, we raised about $400,000, me and my buddies, for this orphanage. We've raised over $2.2 million for them since we've done that. This is just one thing, and I'm not here to brag. What I'm saying is that we should all be doing this. That's the socially responsible thing to do. All right, now, going back to this. So this ESG thing, it really went off the rails because of the U.N., and the UN tried to co-op this and then use it for coercion. So how'd they do that? Well, they established these principles, these ESG principles, um, and they basically got 63 investment companies with about $6.5 trillion in assets under management to come on board with them. And these the six, these companies that controlled $6.5 trillion, they got them to basically agree that if these companies don't adhere to these arbitrary things that we've um, put together, then they get no money. As Mark Carney says, there'll be economic roadkill. So who are they? Well, Amy Dominey, we mentioned her name before, Brian Moynihan, he's the CEO of Bank America. Now, what's important to understand is that, of course, Bank of America, Brian Moynihan, the CEO, alongside the big four accounting firms, so you always hear reference to the big four, Deloitte, PwC, KPMG, and Ernst & Young. So if you're a, a, a publicly traded company or your big uh, Fortune 500 company, you need to use a big four accounting firm. So with Bank of America and the big four, um, they accelerated this ESG transformation through the establishment of a set of standardized measurements of 22 specific metrics to create a framework for companies to report their results. And if their results are favorable, they get funding. If their reports are unfavorable, then they get no funding, no money for you, like the soup Nazi. All right, so that's sort of how this happened. And then we saw other institutions, institutional investors um, grab onto this. Of course, we talk about BlackRock doing this all the time, State Street, Global Advisors, of course, as well, um, and on and on and on. And so this is a really big thing. This is how they've been, uh, they've been tackling this. Now, we can see that a 20, 2022 report by the Global Sustainable Investment Alliance found that global ESG assets under management reached $35.3 trillion in 2021, up from $22.9 trillion in 2016. So we can see that these investment groups are moving into this and putting money into anything that could be deemed ESG. But... Does that change the incentive, incentive structure? Just because they say they're ESG, are they really? How are they reporting this? Well, we're going to dig into that. We're going to dig into that. We're going to talk about the problems that this has created, the crisis that we're literally in because of this and where this goes. These 22 specific goals that uh, companies have to meet if they want to get money, if they want investment. And of course, if you're a business and you don't have any capital... <laughs> You don't have a business. So, of course, they have to do that. But what's happened is, you know, these create perverted incentives. Remember, we talked about um, Friedman talking about really the socially responsible thing for business is to pursue profit. That should be the incentive. And through that incentive, then they'll have good, um, you know, good things that they do, like giving money to the local high school. But when you start to change the incentives, then people start optimizing for other incentives. So for example, like ESG. So if you happen to meet all the factors of an ESG, you get a lot of money. So what do you think happens? <laughs> well, companies start trying to optimize for ESG, so they get a lot of money. And how do they do that? Well, they do that through lying. And stealing, because of course, there is really no way to hit all those goals without that. So they do what we call greenwashing. So they pretend like they're green, even though they're not really. How do they do that? Well, so for example, um, one of the things is to reduce emissions. That's only part of it. So there's environmental, E, environmental, S, social, G is governance. So the E, environmental, is like how much carbon is your, are you outputting, for example, right? Then there's the social so then that's like, what are you doing socially? And then there's the governance. Do you have a diversified board of people on your on your government board? Uh, but on the environmental side, you need to not produce as much carbon because supposedly carbon is somehow like the thermometer of the world. Uh, that's pretty strange if you think about it. But um, anyway, uh, they, they're rated by how much carbon they produce or don't produce. So one of the things that they do is they buy offsets, carbon credits. So... <laughs> For some reason, there are certain things that you can do that create carbon credits. So, for example, Tesla, by making electric vehicles, somehow creates carbon credits that can then be sold. 
And then these companies that produce lots of carbon just buy these carbon credits, and then somehow that gives them a net zero, net being uh, you take the total amount they emit minus what they bought, the credits, gives them a net zero score, right? That's what they're aiming for, the, the net they're trying to bring down. The problem is, is that this is all sort of like a big scam. So where are these credits being created from? How are they being traded? And what is that even doing for the economy? Or I'm sorry, for the environment at all? As a matter of fact, emissions have not gone down at all. Businesses now just spend more money to buy offsets. So they haven't changed the amount of carbon going into the world. They've just now created a side market. Now, what's wrong with that? Well, the side market means that for no other reason than to have some arbitrary goal of bringing down carbon, which hasn't done any of that. Uh, but now they've created this market, which now companies have to buy into, which makes their expenses go up, which means they have to bring their prices up, which means that you get to pay more for your products and services, which means that your quality of life went down. That means you have to work more hours now to have just the same quality of life that you had before because costs have gone up so much. That's one example. We can see report after report after report how it's plagued by fraud. A 2021 report by the Carbon Market Watch found that the carbon credit market is plagued by all kinds of fraud. There's double counting. There's wash trading. There's greenwashing, as I said. Greenwashing is when a company makes false or misleading claims about its environmental credentials in order to sell carbon credits. We see large corporations exploiting ESG principles. For instance, some might use shell companies to make their operations appear more ESG compliant than they are. And this isn't just like some theory. We see this over and over and over and over. As a matter of fact, a 2021 report by the Environmental Investigation Agency found that several large corporations were using shell, corporate, shell companies to avoid environmental regulations. Saudi Aramco, one of the largest companies in the entire world has done this with a $28 billion worth of funds. So this is what this is what's happening. When you create a perverse set of incentives, then you get perverse actions. Now, to take advantage of this, of course, the big evil empire, the largest asset manager of the world, BlackRock, has jumped into the mix, and they started creating ESG funds. So now we're going to create these ES ETFs that have all these ESG companies in there so we can in in uh, raise investment capital directly into this ESG fund. But turns out, when you invest money, you're trying to get money back. So if I'm investing money, I want it to go to the companies that have the best chance of returning my capital, unless it's a donation. Like I said, invest in things that you want. So I give my money to things that maybe I don't expect the best return from just because that's where I want my money going. But for the most part, if you're investing your money, you're trying to get the best return possible. And it turns out when you run a business based off of their ESG scores, and they're not optimizing for profit, well, turns out they don't have the best profit. So it turns out they don't do very well. And as a matter of fact, ES, I'm sorry, BlackRock had to close their ESG fund because of a lack of interest. Why? Because it had poor performance. So you look at all the funds that BlackRock has uh, and the ones that have the worst performance, you don't want to invest into them. And of course, that's the ESG because they weren't optimizing for profits. Um, and so, you know, there's other parts of it. So then there's the social side, which then kind of led to this DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So it's sort of like virtue signaling. This is what's led to a lot of the Dylan Mulvaney, Mulvaney, you know, Budweiser controversy, things like that, because they're trying to now optimize for that, for this DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. We can see that uh, a Just Capital report found that 20% of companies with dedicated DEI roles have eliminated or disregarded those roles altogether. So they're adopting it and they're trying to do it, but then they realize it doesn't really work and it's actually hurting their business of being in business, of being in business, of making profits, <laughs> and they end up abandoning them. So what they're doing is they're, they're doing some sort of virtue signaling. But really, they're not doing anything at all, which is part of the reason why you see Nike running Colin Kaepernick or, you know, uh, like I said, Budweiser or Dylan Mulvaney. They're trying to appease these DEI, you know, gods, these DEI regulators, if you will. But it's a bigger problem than that. So ESG is actually causing, as we started out talking about, an actual crisis. So what do I mean by that? Well, the biggest thing, the E in ESG is environmental. And supposedly, the goal is to bring carbon down. And the number one enemy, according to them, is now energy, specifically fossil fuel energy, which is oil and gas, oil and natural gas. Now, it's funny because 
Do you know what do you know what fossil fuel is? Fossil. It comes from fossils. So it makes you think like some bad connotations. Well, fossil fuel, and I'm not a geologist, so uh, if you are, go ahead and leave me comments and tell me if I get this wrong. But um, fossil fuel come from fossils, which are actually old plants that are in layers of the earth that have been carbonized and have turned into oil and gas. And so we harvest those out. So it's sort of like... Uh, environmental, sort of like renewable. But what they've done is they, they've now labeled those to be bad. And so now we have to go to wind and solar, um, what they call renewable, which is pretty weird because uh, solar panels and windmills last about 20 years. They're not renewable at all. They're consumable. Uh, but anyway, um, they went, they want to go to these renewables. So like in Germany, for example, because of these ESG metrics, they want to transition their energy into green. So they want to have wind and solar. And so they've started to shut down their energy, including their nuclear reactors. Now, just recently, nuclear reactors are now coming back as being green, but uh, skipping that. What we can see has happened. So we saw energy, uh, the energy prices going through the roof because they shut down their energy, their nuclear reactors. Turns out supply and demand still matters. Um, so when they got rid of their nuclear power, their energy prices went through the roof. But then the final straw was the Russia-Ukraine war. They lost the Nord Stream pipelines, and they don't have gas. Now, the reason why this is very, very, very important to understand is because in Europe, you have the southern nations that we call them the pigs, Portugal, Italy, Greece, Spain, all right, the pigs. And they don't really have any um, industry. They don't have any really economic output, exports. They have tourism most, mostly. And so they're part of the EU, European Union, but it's Germany that's the manufacturing hub. It's the engine of Europe. They're the ones that produce all the exports, produce all the money and help support everybody else. But because of what Germany has done by chasing ESG, they've basically shot themselves in the foot or really shot themselves in the head. And so now because of energy prices going sky high, it's caused a massive, massive problem. And what we're witnessing now over the last year is that Germany is in a process of de-industrializing. So industrializing is when we went from no machines to machines. We went from the farms uh, into, you know, factories. But now they're de-industrializing, meaning the factories are disappearing. Well, that doesn't sound very good. Well, it's not. So because of the cost of energy are so high and unreliable, they're being rationed, they can't run all the time, manufacturing companies have had to leave Germany. One of their largest companies, BASF, has left and they went to China. And when these companies leave, they don't just come back. So they're in the process of deindustrializing. Now that's bad for Germany, but it's bad for all of Europe. As a matter of fact, the IMF, International Monetary Fund, expects the German economy to shrink by, by uh, 0.3% this year, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a bad deal. Economies should always be growing. We should always be producing more goods and services, not less. It's a big deal. Now, if that sounds bad, I want to jump to another story about South Africa. South Africa is in a world of hurt, and you won't even believe it. Um, they've been struggling with power shortages for years because, again, yes, they need to be more environmentally conscious, and they need to shut down their cheap, reliable, abundant energy sources and transition to very expensive, costly, and unreliable energy sources. For the E, you know, the ESG, we got to do it, right? So in South Africa... Um, they have been deteriorating for a long time. There's massive economic turmoil and social unrest that's happening right now. It's looming ahead of the elections that are coming next year. And it's getting really bad. Uh, not only is it bad because of the transition, it's also hampered by massive amounts of debt, corruption, and yes, of course, sabotage. So they're trying to figure this out. They want to escape their dependence on coal, cheap, abundant energy, and move to, as I said, uh, unreliable, um, you know, uh, renewables, unreliables. So now they've been um, rash since 2007, ESCOM, which is their power company, has been forced to ration power through intentional blackouts known as something called load shedding. And we have the same thing in Southern California for the exact same reasons. California has to also do load shedding because we can't produce enough energy for everybody. But in South Africa, it's way worse. As a matter of fact, um, they've been shutting off the power for up to 12 hours per day. And now they're predicting that they're going to take the power outages up to 16 hours per day, no energy. Now, 
what would happen if you shut the power off for 16 hours a day? Well, it turns out you don't have a lot of economic activity. The power instability is so widespread that they don't, they have very, very, very limited hospital services. Turns out if you go in the hospital, you probably need machines hooked to electricity and it probably needs to be 24 seven, uh, 16 hours a day if blackouts probably doesn't work. So very limited hospital services. Oh, your kid was born premature and needs to go in an incubator. Sorry, no electricity for you. Oh, you had a heart attack. You need to be on a heart monitor. Oh, sorry. No electricity for you. You get the idea. We have increasing food and water scarcity, rising bankruptcies, worsening crime rates, unemployment exceeding 30%. And South Africa's central bank warns that load shedding is going to cost the economy nearly $13 billion this year. So uh, that's what ESG gets you. Good job. The coal sector, which is what they're trying to get rid of, employs... Uh, indirectly up to 2.3 million people. So at a time when they already have unemployment exceeding 30%, they want to go ahead and just shed jobs for another 2.3 million people. Sounds really good. South Africa is on a course to see its most blackout days in history this year. Wow. So um, again, this is the same thing that's happening in California. It's not a big, it's, it's, it's not, it's nothing new. So this is where ESG gets you. You invest into companies who are not trying their best to produce profits. So they've gotten away with this because BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, they don't care about profits. Why don't they care about profits? Because it's not their money. Well, whose money is it? Well, it's your money. When your pension, when your 401k, when your mutual fund goes into their management, BlackRock, State Street, or Vanguard manages almost all you know, the majority of that, they are investing your money and it's not their money and they make money regardless. So what do they care if the companies underperform other companies? They would rather push an ideology. This is why when people say um, BlackRock, uh, I'm sorry, that's why people say like uh, with Bud, Bud Light, you know, they, they screwed up, hit them where it hurts, go woke, go broke. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to boycott them. Well, they don't really care. And the reason why they don't really care is because they've been taken over by these big in institutional investors who don't invest their own money. They invest your money. And they're more, um, what they care about more is their ideology over profit. And again, that's not a bad thing. We should be investing our money where we see fit. The problem is when you have corporations like BlackRock, Wall Street, um, Vanguard, and State Street doing it with other people's money. That's the problem. That's the, where I have a problem. You should certainly invest your money where you see fit. And if you lose your money, that's on you. But when you have these institutions taking your money and investing in a way that doesn't align with your visions, and on top of them, not only are they investing against your, your vision, your ideologies, and the world that you want, they're not only going against that, they're also losing you money at the same time. That's a problem. That's a big problem. Now, uh, this is a big deal for a lot of reasons. Obviously, one, we know it doesn't work. Going back to what um, Friedman said, really the social responsible thing is to chase profits. Because if you think about it, that drives everything. So, for example, Patagonia um, is a massive you know, clothing manufacturer, make really, really high-end jackets and, and things like that. I'm sure you heard of them. Um, their whole mission is that they make you know, sustainable products, they give money back to the environment, and things like that. So if I care about that, and they want to make profit, then they do those things and we support them. So through their pursuit of profit, they are then doing the social responsible thing. If there's two companies, one company wants to dump you know, hazardous waste into the desert, and the other company wants to recycle and make sure that the hazardous waste doesn't go into the environment, well then we would, as consumers, most likely we would support the company that's not turning my hometown into a hazardous wasteland, so I would support the one that doesn't. And so through their pursuit of profit, hoping that I give them business, they do the socially responsible thing. The problem is when the incentives get perverted. When the government steps in, they and then, then they bring in the bankers, then they bring in the investment companies, and then they start giving money for things, insane things like this, that don't work. And then people start to change their incentives. Perverse incentives lead to perverse outcomes. It all goes back to the money. We can talk about every problem in the world, and it always comes back down to the money. When the money supply is broken, it changes the incentives of everything. And we know this uh, was told a hundred years ago, um, Vladimir Lenin said that the best way to destroy capitalism is to debauch the currency through massive inflation, 
we can steal arbitrarily. So when they inflate money, they steal from you. And it can be done so far that all relation to money is lost, and the best way to get rich is through gambling and theft. Very prophetic words from the uh, leader of the Bolshevik Revolution in uh, communist Russia. Anyway, if you're just tuning in, you're listening to The Mark Moss Show. We just run through what ESG is and the dangers it causes. Hopefully that's helpful. Share this episode with somebody that you think could benefit from it. And that's what I got. Thanks so much for listening today.